to our theme on holy ministry. The holy ministry demonstrates compassion for God's people. You know, I, I think that concept of compassion is something that we're going to focus on today. You know, it's a thing that we want to show to others because Christ has shown that great mercy and compassion to us. Yes, he shows compassion to us in maybe a, a physical way, but more importantly, he shows compassion to us spiritually by giving us grace and mercy. And we want to share that spiritual compassion as well to others. We ask God to bless our worship today and we begin with our opening hymn, hymn 302. Please stand. We begin today in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord Jesus, you are the light of the world, the, the light no darkness can overcome. Stay with us, for it is evening, and the day is almost done. Let your light scatter the darkness. Let it shine in our hearts and lives. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you in our thoughts, in our words, and in our deeds, in all that we have not done. Forgive us in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, deliver and restore us. 
that we may rest in peace. By the mercy of God, we have been bought back from sin, death, and hell by the perfect life and innocent death of Jesus Christ. In him we are forgiven. Let us rest in his peace until the rising of the sun when we shall serve him in newness of life. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty, eternal God, in the word of your apostles and prophets, you have proclaimed to us your saving will. Grant us faith to believe your promises that we may receive eternal salvation through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. We join in singing the psalm of the day. first lesson for today is Numbers 27, verses 15 to 23. Moses' life and ministry were coming to an end. God, in compassion for his people, had Moses appoint Joshua to take his place. Moses said to the Lord, May the Lord, the God, of God who gives breath to all living things, appoint someone over this community to go out and come in before them, one who will lead them out and bring them in. So the Lord's people will not be like sheep without a shepherd. So the Lord said to Moses, Take Joshua, son of Nun, a man in whom is the spirit of leadership, and lay your hand on him. Have him stand before Eleazar the priest and the entire assembly, and commission him in their presence. Give him some of your authority, so that the whole Israelite community will obey him. He is to stand before Eleazar the priest, who will obtain decisions for him by inquiring of the Urim before the Lord. At his command, he and the entire community of the Israelites will go out, and at his command, they will come in. Moses did as the Lord commanded him. He took Joshua and had him stand before Eleazar the priest and the whole assembly. Then he laid his hands on him and commissioned him as the Lord instructed through Moses. This is the word of the Lord. The second lesson is 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 to 7. The congregation in Corinth was troubled and divided. 
Paul wrote them, not our, out of anger, but out of compassion, not to shame them, but to warn them. This, then, is how you ought to regard us as servants of Christ, and as those entrusted with my, the minis, mysteries that God has revealed, now it is required that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. I care very little if I am judged by you or by any human court. Indeed, I do not even judge myself. My conscience is clear, but that does not make me innocent. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait until the Lord comes. He will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and will expose the motives of the heart. At that time, each will receive their praise from God. Now, brothers and sisters, I have uh, applied these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit, so that you may learn from us the meaning of the saying, do not go beyond what is written. Then you will go, not be puffed up in being a follower of one of us over against the other. For who makes you different from anyone else? What do you have that you did not receive? And if you did receive, what do you boast as though you did not? This is the word of the Lord. Please stand out of respect for the gospel. The gospel for today is Matthew chapter 9, verses 35 to chapter 10, verse 8. This will serve as our sermon text for today. Jesus had compassion on the people, and he appointed the twelve to demonstrate compassion through their holy ministry. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowd, he had compassion on them, because they were harassed and helpless. Like sheep without a shepherd, then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into the harvest field. Jesus called his twelve disciples to him and gave them authority to drive out impure spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. These are the names of the twelve apostles. First Simon, who is called Peter, and his brother Andrew, James the son of Zebedee, and his brother John, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector. James, son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent out with the following instruction. Do not go among the Gentiles, or enter any town of the Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. As you go, proclaim this message. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, Drive out demons, freely you have received, freely give. This is the gospel of the Lord. We join in confessing our faith using the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> Grace and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Have you ever experienced compassion? Have you ever showed someone else Compassion. How did that make you feel? If you experience compassion from someone, you probably feel cared for and even loved, right? But it's quite interesting, just the aspect of compassion. It doesn't matter if you give it or receive it. The, the motivation behind compassion is this kindness and love 
for the individual. And, and when we show compassion, we are willing to give up a lot, aren't we, often? Maybe it's our time. Maybe it's our own emotions. Maybe it's a, a, a gift of sorts or, or some kind of substance or, or food or a monetary gift. You know, there's so many ways we can show physical compassion to others as we care for maybe our, our, our parents or our kids or our neighbors and things like that. And as you look at the life of Jesus, you see this physical compassion that Jesus showed to others as he traveled about. Yet there was this better form of compassion in a sense, if you want to kind of say that, you know, a, 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 a compassion that really impacts, yes, this life, but the life to come. And that is spiritual compassion. And as we reflect on, on Jesus' life here today in our gospel reading, we see him exhibit this, you know, spiritual compassion on those that he was working with. And as we think about this kind of physical compassion, spiritual compassion, you know, it really fits with our, our, our theme or series that we're covering at the beginning of this kind of Pentecost season, the holy ministry. The holy ministry that we are a part of it is rooted in compassion, isn't it? And we want to show this compassion to others as a church and as believers. And so as we delve into compassion, we, we understand that it, it demands this kind of engagement with other people. Compassion cannot be kind of isolated by itself or, or, or just to, to me. No. Compassion is often shown to other individuals. And it, it kind of asks of us to get our hands dirty a bit, doesn't it? You know, it's not always easy to show compassion. You might have to take on some of the, the individual's baggage, their struggles. It might inconvenience your life, you know, to maybe drive them here or, you know, help them out in this way. And so you kind of ask the question, was Jesus willing to get his hands dirty? Was he willing to show compassion to those who were around him? I know that sounds like a silly question, because we already know the answer to that. Yes, Jesus was willing to get his hands dirty, to show compassion both physically and both spiritually. And so we, we hear this in our text for today. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. You know, at the end of this verse is kind of where I want to focus first off. Because, again, Jesus cared for the physical needs of these people. As he traveled from village to village, from town to town, what did he do? He cared for their physical needs. He, he, he healed everyone who was sick and, and, and hurting. You know, God, in his righteous wisdom, Jesus our Savior, used his divine power to heal the bodies of those who were in front of them. A wide range of illnesses and sicknesses. You know, Jesus cares about the body. Jesus cares about the temple that God has given to his people to serve him and the place where he dwells in the hearts of his people. Yes, Jesus has compassion physically, you know, for these people. And he cares for them. But again, Jesus is not just limited to physical compassion, but most importantly, he cares about the spiritual compassion that he shows to so many people. And so at the beginning of that verse, you, you hear that Jesus went teaching at the different synagogues. You know, wouldn't it be kind of interesting to see and hear how long Jesus taught in those synagogues? You know, did he teach through the night? Was he right there, you know, early in the morning when the sun rose? You know, what was he teaching about? What kind of topics? You know, how amazing it would have been to kind of sit at the feet of Jesus in a sort of Bible study setting and learning about the, the scriptures in this deep way and how much, you know, that would have been edifying for our hearts and our souls. 
strengthening our faith to hear the word of God from the mouth himself, the Savior and Lord. You know, well, what a wonderful opportunity that these people had to you know, have this spiritual compassion, you know, that Jesus took this time to teach them. But it wasn't just teaching, he also proclaimed, we hear. And what did he proclaim about? The good news of the kingdom. Or the, 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 we see elsewhere, if you read in the Gospels, you'll hear this kind of phrase, that Jesus proclaimed about the kingdom of God. You know, Jesus wanted those individuals to know who he was and why he was here. He wanted them to have their hearts and eyes and minds fixed on the life after this. And this kingdom impacts their lives right now, but most importantly, it would impact their lives eternally in the kingdom of heaven. You know, did Jesus care about their spiritual well-being? Did he show spiritual compassion? Yes, he did. He, he most certainly did. And, and he did this in, in, in the, the towns and villages that he went. You know, how, how wonderful that is. So maybe it's important for us to contemplate a little bit more about this great compassion that Jesus showed. We hear, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. You know, you could picture a bustling crowd, you know, as Jesus walks in, and, and then they find out that Jesus is coming to their town or village. You can probably expect them waiting at the gate or, or the entrance to their town, you know, waiting for Jesus to arrive. And there all the sick people are waiting to, for Jesus to heal them. And so, you know, you see all these people of different ages and maybe some eth different ethnicities or, or different groups. And here he is, you know, Jesus walking in and caring for them. And, and what are we told? As he looks at all the people, what is on his heart? Compassion. You know, this mercy and love for the people around him. And they're all, you know, maybe <laughs> different um, economic standings, professions, you know, all these different walks of life. And Jesus has compassion for all of them in the spiritual way. And, and the words that we hear in the NIV are this, harassed and helpless. That's how these, you know, people are described. In other translations, it's described as this troubled or, or downcast. You know, these people are troubled and, and, and you know, heavy of heart. They're, they're, they're struggling through life. And maybe you could kind of picture it this way, you know, as the shepherd and his sheep. You know, these sheep are, are, are you know, flipped on their backs. They're, they're falling down and they can't get upright again. As hard as they try, they, they can't get back on their feet. And so this shepherd comes along and flips them back on their feet, focuses on them back on him. And he has this compassion and love that only a shepherd can have for his own sheep. You know, this is the kind of compassion that our great shepherd has for his people. And he exhibits it in our gospel reading for today in these towns and villages. So uh, another way Jesus showed spiritual compassion was by, you know, essentially, you know, so people need to serve these people, Right? And Jesus knew that he would not be on this earth forever. And that people of his, the, these servants, these messengers, would have to show the same compassion that he had for these people uh, as well. And, and so we kind of hear, hear this, that you know, Jesus is already thinking about this. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into the harvest field. Last week, you know, if you were here for the kind of sermon study, I kind of briefly kind of hinted on this passage. And, and it's a very important passage as you think about the holy ministry, as you think about people who are serving the Lord and his sheep. You know, the Lord knows his, his field. He, he knows the people who are out there. And, and he knows that they need to be served. And, and he, he knows that, you know, the, the workers are going to be few. But the people need to be served nonetheless. 
people need to encourage other individuals to consider serving in God's church as pastors or teasters or staff ministers and serve God's sheep, you know, flipping them over, caring for them, showing compassion in their distress, showing compassion in their struggles, showing compassion as they feel life's weight upon them. And God's people, you know, are asked to encourage their pastors, to support their pastors, to, to be the, the right hand and the left hand of helping the pastor in the ministry of the church and serving God's people along with him. And as you think about this idea of harvesting as a, a minister or just as people of God, you know, what a task that is. You know, every year we get to the kind of that fall season and then it's harvest time for all the farmers around here and it seems like things kind of pick up. You know, when it's harvest time, do, do farmers kind of, you know, go to their house and, and lay back in their lazy boy and say, ah, I'll kind of wait on this? Probably not. You know, they're, they're waiting for the opportune time when it's dry and it's not wet, when, you know, they can get on that field and they're getting at it. They're moving along. They're harvesting the crop. And they might even call in extra hands to help so that they can get that crop off even faster. And maybe they feel like they still don't have enough hands to help. But the, the job needs to be done. And it needs to be done timely and in a certain way. There's kind of a deadline to it. So you think about God's harvest, right? You know, He has a, 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 a harvest that needs to be done. And there's workers that need to, you know, do the work. Yes, God in his divine wisdom and strength could, you know, harvest the crop despite us. But he wants to use us. He wants to use us as people, as spokespeople to speak his word and to bring in that harvest uh, along with his grace and mercy. You know, how, how wonderful that is that God uses us uh, to be harvesters. Um, to be farmers in, in his fields. So it, it doesn't seem, obviously, like a good situation if you, if you don't have enough workers, doesn't it? You know, if you don't have enough workers on the field to get off the crop, you, you could have more trouble in the end. And, and so you, you think about that when it comes to God's church. You're like, we should have a lot of workers. There's so much work that needs to be done. You know, you just think about our church here at, at Calvary, and how much that needs to be done, and how much we're trying to do. And it seems like we could almost use several extra hands to do this. And then you start thinking, okay, there's other churches around. There's people that aren't being served yet, that don't even have a church. There's people around the world who don't even know who Jesus is. And so you say, there is a huge need for workers. And you say, well, what can we do? Well, Jesus gives us an answer, doesn't he? He says, ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into the harvest field. So, what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to pray. We're supposed to go to the one, the, the, the greatest farmer, the, the harvester, the one who owns the, the, the fields and the farms and the people, and so he, we go to him and say, hey, Lord, we need harvesters. We need workers in your church. Bless us with these workers. Encourage families to um, encourage young men to consider the ministry. Help us as a, a church or churches to encourage these young men to, to serve your, your kingdom and to harvest. You know, Go out into the world and preach this good news to all creation. You know, we need those people. We need those workers. But even though the workers are few, God provides the right worker at the right time. He provides what a church may need. And it may challenge a church at, at certain times. But a worker is still valuable. He still has a purpose. These workers might have different skills and different abilities, and that's perfectly okay. Because we, we need those different gifts and abilities. We just need people to serve in the fields. You know, maybe it's just doing what we need to get done in certain churches. And so we have other people who uplift the, the, the workers themselves. 
You know, the members who encourage and fill in areas where the, the, the minister is weak, where he just doesn't have the skills. And, and that's, again, okay. But God provides the right worker at the right time as he calls these workers to serve his fields. So whom did Jesus send then into this New Testament field? Jesus called his 12 disciples to him and gave them authority to drive out impure spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. You know, essentially Jesus is beginning to tell them, hey, I'm calling you. And I'm going to give you these abilities to, you know, launch off the New Testament church. And some of these gifts are specific to these apostolic individuals. And so they served the purpose in God's church so that they could care for the spiritual needs and physical needs. That they could show compassion in this physical way by healing the sick just as Jesus did. But as they do that, they would also show compassion spiritually to that, these people as well. And you think about this, that they, yes, they were supposed to go to the Jews first. But, you know, eventually what happens on Pentecost? They, they go out to the Gentiles as well. This message is for all people. All, all people need this saving grace. So, yet these men that we hear that are going to be out harvesting in the fields, they're just ordinary men, aren't they? These are the names of the twelve apostles. First, Simon, who, called, who is called Peter and his brother Andrew, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. Think about all these ordinary men, you know, that God is calling. You know, here are the fishermen, you know, the, the, the tax collector and others. I, I think it's interesting that Jesus doesn't call the, the, the politicians the judges and lawyers. He doesn't even call the, the religious leaders. Instead, he calls these average Joes that we might consider. You know, I, I think it's amazing that, you know, you know, people that you might think that wouldn't be equipped for the ministry, Jesus says you're equipped for the ministry. And maybe they had people skills. Maybe they could talk like everybody else. You know, maybe they could relate to a lot of the things that their members or their people went through. Who knows? But you kind of look at that last name. I think that's interesting. You know, who, who's on there? Judas Iscariot. And then, would you want to have that label for all eternity in the pages of Scripture about who you are and what you did? You know, who, who betrayed Jesus? But you, you see God's compassion right here. You see God's compassion, even though, you know, Judas you know, decided his fate... Jesus still called him. Jesus still called this sinner to ser serve in his church. And in, that encompasses all of us in a certain way. God calls us as sinners to serve in his church. And we bask in that forgiveness. Um, or maybe we kind of wonder if Judas really basked in that forgiveness that was his and could have been his. But what were these men tasked with, right? These 12 Jesus sent out with the following instruction. Do not go among the Gentiles or enter any town uh, of the Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. As you go, proclaim this message. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. Jesus wanted, yes, again, to have the disciples focus on the Jews. But the Gentiles would have their time. They, they would be witness to. They would receive this message of grace and the message of Jesus. And they were to do this, you know, because they had received this grace, this compassion freely. Jesus wanted them to freely give this compassion back to these individuals that they would too witness as well. 
maybe it would be good for us at this time to kind of think about ourselves and do some self-reflection. You know, how often do you actively engage in the act of compassion? And maybe let's focus on that physical compassion. You know, do you, do you struggle to show physical compassion to others? I think when it maybe comes to our family, we might say, yes, I, I show my family compassion. You know, that, that's pretty easy. I, I'm willing to, you know, give them the shirt off of my back. I'm willing to, you know, drop everything and go, you know, help them when they're in distress or in need. Or even when they're not, I, I'm happy to do that. But what about others? What about people you, you, you don't know? What about people that look a little different than you? What about people who are struggling mentally or physically or monetarily? Do you show compassion to them? Uh, are you willing to get your hands dirty with them? Or, or do you say, uh, that seems a little like too much. I don't want to get my hands that dirty. Uh, I, I don't want to get involved in their lives because I, I don't know how that's really going to inconvenience my life. You know, I, 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 I don't want to, you know, give up the hard things that I work for. You know, just because they were irresponsible. And maybe we think, you know, I don't want to be taken advantage of. But maybe, should we stop showing compassion because we don't want to be taken advantage of? You know, if we're showing compassion as Jesus shows compassion, you know, are we just not doing, aren't we doing what we're supposed to be doing? You know, caring for people, caring for their lives, letting people know who are hurting, that we're willing to listen to them and go out of our ways to help them. Yes, we, we might not be able to help everybody in the world, no. But maybe God puts people in our lives once in a while to say, you know, here's this opportunity to help them. Here's the opportunity to let your light shine to the world at this very moment. And what that opportunity might open is the opportunity to show spiritual compassion to these people as well, right? Right? You know, how well do you do at showing spiritual compassion? How well do you do at showing your faith to others? You know, do you feel like you're comfortable sharing your faith with your family and those you, you love and dear? Sometimes I think people really struggle with even that group. You know, you, you, you struggle to know and <laughs> what to say. You, you, you struggle with, I, I, I don't know if I want to, you know, talk about Jesus in church right now with my, my husband, my wife, and kids because I don't know what the outcome is going to be, so I'm just going to leave it well alone. But is that really showing spiritual compassion by not doing it? By avoiding it? Cer certainly not. You know, we must share our faith. You know, if Jesus went teaching and proclaiming about the kingdom of God, yes, we must do the same. And it's not easy. It can be challenging. You can face resentment. You can face people who, who want nothing to do with it, even family. But does that, it does not mean we stop. You know, it does not mean that we stop saying, you really need Jesus right now. You really need to hear his word in his house. Again, it's not just our families, but it's all those others around us as well. You know, we, we must share our faith. We must care for them. Not just physically, but most importantly spiritually. Because in the end, that's what matters, isn't it? If we don't care for their spiritual well-being, and we just care for their physical bodies, feeding them, clothing them. It means nothing. But if we care for them as the Lord cares for them, as we share our faith with them, that, that, again, that's what matters. 
as we look at our lives, we see all these different ways where we struggle to show this physical and spiritual compassion, don't we? And we kind of wonder, why would the Lord want to show compassion to me if I, I don't show it very well to even my loved ones or my friends or neighbors? And the truth is, God shouldn't show us any compassion. He, he should smite us, he should strike us down, he should judge us, yes. But isn't that what makes God's compassion so wonderful? <laughs> that despite us, he shows us love and grace. Despite who we are, despite what we have, despite what we worked for, God still loves us immensely. He just shows us this greatest compassion as he sends his one and only son into this world as we see Jesus getting his hands dirty for you and me, your loved ones, your friends, your neighbors, those you don't know in the world. He gets his hands dirty by taking on your sin, taking on your baggage, putting it on him and suffering upon the cross to forgive your sins so that you can be redeemed, so that you can experience God's spiritual compassion on you as a sinner, making you righteous and clean. <laughs> Our God has so much compassion. Yes, as we heard, the Heavenly Father, he's, He sent His one and only Son to die for us. He showed compassion passion to you as you heard his word through the mouth of your pastors, through the, the mouth of your parents or, or your loved ones or friends, as you heard that the word of God proclaimed on you in your baptism, there is God's compassion. There is God's love that you remember over and over again. Hold on to that compassion. Hold on to that mercy and love that God has shown to us. And as you hear and feel that compassion, you know, how does that make you feel? It makes you feel joyful. It makes you feel happy. It makes you feel overjoyed that there is someone who cares about you, even in your darkness, even when you feel alone, even when the world feels like it's falling apart, even when the world is attacking you, you have someone who's compassionate and gracious to you. And even when your loved ones or you have walked away, God in his compassion, like his sheep, come and flip you back up on your feet and bring you back to his fold. You know, here is this compassion that is showered on us. Lord, help us to show this compassion to others. Lord, help us to have hearts that care for the bodies of your temples that you have you know, put in this world. But most importantly, help us show the spiritual compassion. Help us to be, you know, soft and caring with those around us. Help us to be patient with those who are struggling spiritually, but also have this eagerness and seriousness about it that, hey, we don't know how much time we have. The Lord could return. How wonderful that our God is compassionate to us. And we get to show this compassion to others. That we get to have the opportunity, again, when people are hurting, to show the same compassion Jesus showed to us freely to them, not of charge. You know, you, you, you say, we're not at the front door saying, you know, there, there, there's a, a certain amount of money you have to pay before you get in the doors. No, it's free. Come in, hear God's word. You know, hear the free message of Jesus' compassion and his love and grace. And it doesn't matter who you are, what you've done, what your age is, you know, where you've walked through life. Here's this free compassion and grace that God has given to you. And we shower to others. Amen. Please stand. The peace of God which surpasses all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God of grace and truth, in your divine wisdom, you had compassion on us sinners. We thank you for this. You are filled with immense love and grace that we 
struggle to comprehend because we wonder how could someone love, love us. But that is exactly what you have done. In the pit of despair, in our weakness, you showed compassion. Yes, you care for our physical needs, but most importantly, you care for our spiritual needs. Thank you for showing this physical and spiritual compassion through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who died for us so that we might live for you. Help us to show this compassion to others. Make us bold to witness you to those we care about and those who are around us. Help us use those who are part of our church to help us in this endeavor so that we may you know, go after the sheep who are lost. To go over after the sheep that have been flipped over and are on their backs. Help us in our, our, your compassion to flip them over and face their eyes on you. We serve you in all things. Amen. And we join to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The Almighty and merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit bless and keep us. Amen. You may be seated. We join singing in the closing hymn. special welcome to our guests and visitors. It's always a pleasure to worship with you. Um, just a couple of announcements. The Little Lambs um, program is coming up here um, on June 25th. Uh, this is going to be a new program that our moms are trying to start up and um, it's kind of just how exciting. You know, there's this kind of life and support and encouragement that we're trying to instill in our members and our people and, you know, kind of let them know that they're not alone. Um, you know, there's a lot of people who are struggling with a lot of things and maybe you don't realize it. And so to have that kind of encouragement as a mom um, in this setting would be a good thing. Um, so uh, this is something that the moms are running. I am not a part of this. Um, they're kind of figuring it out as they go along. And so this is kind of one of those things that's just kind of um, manifesting itself through our congregation. And so I think that's really exciting and it's really cool to see. Um, the, uh, and I hope God... Uh, blesses it, because it could turn into not just a, a church thing, but it could turn into an outreach thing too, um, where maybe there's moms of the community that maybe you can invite um, and say, hey, would you like to join us for this? Um, so uh, just kind of uh, let people know about this, and if you know people with little ones, um, maybe they would like to consider coming. Um, the RSVP 
even if they don't RSVP, and they, they can still come. But um, by the 22nd, they want to kind of have an idea for snacks and maybe craft and just make sure they have enough. Um, so if, if there are some people you know who are interested, um, please let me know. Um, also, uh, I have started up the fishing with pastor thing. Uh, maybe you saw that our little one, Aiden, went with, and that was a lot of fun. We really enjoyed that. Um, even at the dinner table, he was even talking about fishing and um, how many fish he caught. So he, he's got the bug. Um, but it, it was really, it was a nice, uh, a nice day, and I, I'm glad um, he was able to come. And I hope, uh, if you know anybody that's interested in doing fishing or anything like that, um, please let me know, and I'd be happy to do that, because it's, I enjoy visiting with our members, and also I get to relax a little bit too and um, get to do that. Um, just kind of as I, I think about the, the sermon today and stuff like that and the, the, the Little Lands program, I kind of think about, you know, how do we witness to, like, our families and friends? And I, I think sometimes we, we think, you know, do I have to be, like, aggressive? You know, like, you know, you haven't been to church in a while, you know, um, or, you know, you really should go to church. Um, I, I think sometimes, you know, as a, a pastor, I, I, I try to be patient. But patience doesn't mean just kind of pushing it off forever either, right? But patience is kind of, you know, are there these windows that open up, you know, where it's kind of like, here's my opportunity. Uh, and, and, you know, maybe it's done in such a way where it's like, you know, here, here's this program for the, the little kids, you know, Oh, you know, I, you just had a baby like a year ago or so. You know, w would you like to, you know, join us for this? You know, we're, we were just inviting people. Or maybe it's like, hey, you know, I, I was talking to somebody at church the other day, and I heard that they were struggling, and they appreciated, you know, the, the words that we heard in church th this week. Maybe you might want to check out the sermon uh, online or watch the service online, and, and, and maybe that might help you a little bit. Or, you know, you know the, this pastor guy, you know, he, he's willing to sit down with anybody. He, he's happy to, you know, go fishing with you. you maybe you should invite him out, you know. Um, I'm happy to do those things. Or it's like, hey, hey, pastor, you know, um, so this event is going on. Um, you know, here, here's this, uh, you know, uh, this graduation. Maybe you should stop by. And then you, you, you see so-and-so and you say, you know, how are you doing? Um, so, you know, there, there's ways to, you know, take those windows and those opportunities to share our faith. You know, the, hey, there's a, there's a big thing going on at church. Maybe you want to check it out. Um, hey, we had this new family come in that, we, you know, we, I, I don't know who they really are, but they got these little ones. You know, they're kind of the same ages as yours, or, you know, we have these other people that are coming, you know, they're about the same age as you. I think you would like them. You know, you know those are kind of ways that we can kind of think. And it may be, you know, I, I've kind of think, you know, like texting, people are comfortable with texting now. And, and if you kind of text something to somebody, it's kind of non-threatening. And they can deal with it when they want to. They can think about it when they want to. They can respond when they want to. And so you don't really put them on the spot. Um, it's something that I sometimes try just to kind of see how people are doing. You know, I, I just care about our people, and so I, I might just text people. I do that a lot. But maybe sometimes I, I've kind of noticed, like, hey, this is not threatening to people. And it's just kind of like, oh, it's nice to kind of hear from my pastor um, and what the, he's thinking of my life. So maybe that's something that you can do too. Um, so if you have um, a situation or things like that where you're kind of like, hey, or you know people who are kind of struggling with, you know, how do we share our faith, um, please talk to me, and I, um, I'm one to kind of problem solve. <laughs> and I'll, I'll think of things outside the box and try to say, you know, how, how can we phrase this in an eloquent way? The, the phrase that I like to use, and I think my wife is sick of it, is um, finesse. I like to finesse things. Like, you know, how, how do I finesse this situation in such a way that it kind of resonates with this person? Um, being heartfelt, but also using the words. If I'm talking to a farmer... I should talk in farmer terms. If I'm talking to an accountant, I should talk in accountant terms. Um, you know, and I think that's important. Um, if I'm talking to a teenager, I'm not going to talk to them as uh, the same way I'm going to talk to a shut-in, right? I'm going to talk to them a little bit different, um, but I'm still going to say essentially the same thing if I'm sharing my faith. 
Um, so it's, it's kind of a, a thing to learn and um, practice, but yeah, it's just stuff I've been thinking about myself. So uh, welcome to the crazy mind of a pastor. So um, God's blessings on the rest of your week, and I hope to see you next week.